Hello, everyone. Hello, Aisha and Naima. So today I uh, will uh, continue with our class and uh, when others join, uh, I'll keep admitting them because time is a factor. And uh, I just like you to know that uh, today is the last class for jurisprudence. Uh, am I audible? I think I am just, I just. Uh, okay, so uh, today is the last class, as I was saying earlier, and uh, um, we'll try our best to complete our syllabus today. Uh, the class will be for one hour, that is for from eight to nine, that is now eight, five to nine, five, Somalia time. And yet another thing would be that uh, in case you want to exit the class after the one hour, you can do so, but I will continue with the lecture. And you can just follow up with the recording because I've got directions from the university just to complete the syllabus because your, um, uh, you know, the tentative date for your examination uh, is already provided. And uh, I mean, you have to complete your uh, exams as well as your forthcoming semester is almost around the corner. So having said that, we'll directly go to our slides. And today we are going to learn about statutes we are going to learn about constitution and also about uh, you know uh, how different constitutions of the world how important they are and when laws are made as against the constitution on and whether at all just one minute yeah and when laws are made uh, as against the constitution, whether at all the laws would be upheld or it would be abrogated. So this is what we're going to learn in today's class. These are the last chapters, statutes, constitutions, and international law. Uh, just because the international law part of it is coming under jurisprudence, uh, I mean, under the subject of jurisprudence, you'll just have to know the basics of international law. But international law by itself is a very vast subject. It's an entirely new, sub I mean, a whole subject. It is a big chunk of uh, laws that one needs to know, like covenants, treaties, international treaties, like UNO documents, like and uh, different, uh, you know, uh, re regulations and so on. However, since we're studying under jurisprudence, under jurisprudence, we'll just be touching only slightly on the aspect of international law, uh, just to introduce inter uh, international law and just to know about the basics. So if you remember, when I was teaching you legislation, Lecture and legislation, I have used the word statute. So what is statute? Statute means a law, a law that is passed by the parliament. Just excuse my voice today <clears throat> because I'm not well, but I can carry on, not a problem. Uh, but just let me know in case you don't understand anything. Statute means a law and it is a legislation which is passed by the parliament or enacted by the parliament. <clears throat> now, here, as we said earlier, just some time back, it is a law that is promulgated. That means it is announced under the act of the parliament. Promulgated means announced. Statute simply means a law enacted by the parliament or the legislature. With the passage of time, Statutes may be amended by lawmaking body, or that is the legislature, or even repealed or abrog abrogated. What is repealed or abrogated? Repealed or abrogated means where the law would be struck down as a bad law. Just uh, at the inception of this class, in the beginning, when just when Aisha and Naima were there, I was talking about constitution and I said that if any law is made against <clears throat> the constitution of the land, it would be struck down as bad law. So likewise, if a law is bad, it would be repealed or abrogated. Now, <clears throat> sorry.
statutes command an action or prohibit something or declares a policy. So what is statute? Statute means a law. What is the role of the law? It will either command an action or it will prohibit something or it will declare a policy. I'm repeating. What is the role of a statute or the law? It will either command an action that is to do something or not to do something or prohibit something that is not to do something or declares a policy. Or it might say that this is the policy that it has to be followed. Now, <clears throat> Statutes can be broadly classified <clears throat> based on duration, method, effect, extent of application, and object. Just excuse my voice today. <clears throat> then what is duration-based classification? Duration means the period of time or time. Based on the duration, a law can be either a permanent law or a temporary law. So based on duration, you can call it as a permanent statute or a temporary statute. What is the example of a permanent statute? Like you have criminal laws of your land. That's a permanent statute. However, permanent in the sense, it, it, it is also subject to amendments. It may also be amended. But what is the permanent nature of the law there is? Criminal laws will be existing. However, what is a crime and what is not a crime? It may keep changing with the passage of time as the society advances or as the society keeps changing. So the, I mean, the, the, the context of the law may change uh, and uh, you know, certain uh, elements in the law may change, but the entire law cannot change. What is criminal, or what is a crime or what is a criminal act and not a criminal act may change, but criminal laws as a whole chunk will always exist. This is an ex example of permanent statute. For example, let me give you a simple example. <clears throat> uh, uh, see, um, in one part of the world, I'll not take the name of the country. In one part of the world, they said that, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, ladies should not wear, uh, you know, short dresses, or they should not wear, like say, mini, mini uh, skirts and so on. But later on, it just happened that as the world advanced, the society accepted that. And today it is no more, uh, you know, it is no more an offense. You know, even if someone is, you know, wearing, uh, I mean, not so modest clothes, the police would not file a case against them. Again, yet another example would be, uh, uh, like for example, like in India, uh, you know, cohabiting without marriage was once upon a time a crime that is living under one roof without marriage was once upon a time but today due to certain reasons and so-called advancement of the society they say that uh, you know living in relationship is also okay likewise in some other parts of the world again i'll not take the name of those countries uh, like you know living together as man and woman but i would not say husband and wife uh, but living together is legitimate and children born to such a union would be considered as a legitimate uh, uh, child. Because uh, why they're saying that is today, because no, no, no doubt that the parents do not have, um, you know, uh, they are not bound by the law in that particular relationship. However, the children should not suffer as a result of that union. Therefore in some parts of the world without taking the name of the countries today they have uh, you know uh, they have changed the laws and they said that living together as man and you know as a girlfriend or whatever so it is not considered to be a crime but once upon a time you know the police had the right to come and raid and they would also be arrested if the if there is no marriage if the, you don't have a marriage certificate uh, if there is no valid existing marriage and if a couple is found without marrying, uh, without a valid marriage certificate, they would be, uh, you know, they would be imprisoned and so on. So therefore, uh, criminal laws would stand as it is. But what is crime and what is not a crime? 
you know, it should keep changing as a society evolves and how society changes and how it thinks and so on. So that is an example of permanent statute. What is temporary statute? Temporary statute is passed for a limited period of time. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Limited period of time or short duration. Example, uh, like say you might have, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, laws which are passed, um, you know, for elections. Example, for elections, for political elections. Sometimes they come up with, uh, you know, shorter uh, statutes or shorter laws. So this is an example. Next classification on the type of laws or type of statute is mandatory, obligatory, imperative, all mean the same. Statute which obliges or calls for strict compliance. That means if it is not complied with, that would be a like, you know, probably it would call for a fine and so on. Next is permissive or directory statute. That is permissive in nature, which does not compel compulsory compliance or mandatory compliance, but is in more in the form of directives for common good. Next is classification with reference to object, object or the purpose. Now, under that we have codified statute and consolidated statute. What is codified statutes? Codified statutes are normally statutes or laws which is divided into sections and articles like section one, section two, section three, or article one, article two, art, article three. It is drafted mostly into authoritative sections and articles systematically. Okay, that means one below the other with the aim to bring about uniformity on a particular subject. That's a codified statute. Again, example for this would be again criminal laws would be a codified statute. What is a consolidated statute? Like refers to statutes which present the laws in a consolidated form, like by compiling even ancient laws and merging it with the present. Example, the law of torts. See, for law of torts, you're, you're not having sections like section one or article one, article two. But however, in Somalia, I said the, the situation is something different. It comes under the civil law of the land. Okay. But I'm talking about consolidated statute reference to the English laws or the common laws. The law of statute could be an example. Uh, sorry, the law of uh, thoughts could be an example of consolidated statute. So there are different type of classifications. This was classification with reference to object. Next is declaratory statute, that means which actually is enacted with the aim to provide clarification to an already existing law. That means a law is already there and then a new statute is enacted or a law or a rule is promulgated by the parliament or the lawmaking body just to provide clarification to an already existing law. Next is remedial statute. What is remedial? By the name itself, as it suggests, something that provides for remedies. Like, for example, Workmen Compensation Act and so on. Next is enabling statute. Again, the name itself suggests something that allows to enable is categorically passed in some cases where an act that is illegal prima facie will now be considered as legal. I gave an example. Uh, cohabitation between a man and a woman is was once upon a time considered illegal in, you know, uh, in, I, I did not name the country deliberately. But um, say in country X, but today it is allowed. Uh, again, yet another example could be is free movement without ma mask. You know that it keeps changing. Laws on licenses to carry guns, pistols, or knives. You know it keeps changing. Enabling statute. These are examples. <coughs> Sorry. Next is this enabling statute means. Quite contrary to the aforementioned enabling statute, here a particular act or right is abrogated. That means a right is taken away. Next is fiscal statute. That means something relating to finances or a tax statute. This pertains to imposition of taxes or laws on fiscal aspects, on financial aspects. Like, uh, for example, so much percentage of tax would be levied or value added taxes, so and so percent and so on. Next is penal statute, that is something related to crime and which wants to impose a punishment. So those are penal statutes. That refers to statutes that impose punishment for offenses or acts that are in contravention of the law. That means which is against the law. Next is explanatory statute, an additional law that may be passed to explain an already existing law or a statute is explanatory statute. Next is curative statute. What is curative statute? By the name itself, it cures. It cures the defects of the previous law. 
Next is classification with reference to extent of application. Like, you know, you can also call it as, uh, you know, the jurisdiction. Like, for this, again, you have the public statute as well as private statute. Public statute governs public affairs, collective rights of the society. <coughs> Sorry. And private statute governs individual relationships within a society. So what is public statute? Public statute basically deals with or is a law which governs the society at large. Public statute. It is for the entire society. Private statute, it's normally like a law which governs individual relationship. Example, contractual laws or laws of contract. Next is classification based on effect. There is statutes with immediate effect, retroactive statute and retrospective statute. Immediate effect means it says that as soon as it is promulgated, as soon as um, the law is announced, it will come into effect. Retroactive means it operates from some past date. Normally this doesn't happen, but still it was existing once upon a time, retroactive statutes that it operates from some past dates and regulates some past acts. And normally, this should not be allowed as well, but well, this is one of the categories. Next. Next is retrospective statute. As the name itself suggests, the retrospective statute operates from the future date, but takes away the vested rights and creates a new law with respect to past actions. That is something which is future oriented. So therefore, based on the effect, when it will come into effect, we have three types, statutes with immediate effect, retroactive statute and retrospective statutes. Next is prospective, that is again, future oriented, totally future oriented, that will come in the, which, which is probably going to come up in the future, that is prospective statutes. Or they would say that this law will be made applicable from August, 2022. Example, prospective statutes. Now, having known what is statute, that means a law, always, you know, people from the legal field, be it lawyers or judges, they always, you know, uh, have a problem with respect to knowing the intention of the legislature and finding out the real meaning of a particular law. For example, when a matter comes up before the court, in order to provide the best justice possible, you know, um, lawyers will have to interpret the laws and convince the judges saying that the aim of the legislature or the will of the legislature was for the good of dash, whatever purpose it may be. So normally in the legal field, interpretation of statutes play a very important role and you know lawyers or even judges they get caught up when it comes to the question of interpretation of statutes or finding out the real meaning of statutes or arguing upon the the meaning of a particular law so statutes are laws passed expressing the will or intention of the legislature however in the utility or the use of laws laws must be interpreted having ascertained the will of the legislature that is having understood the will or the intention of the legislature or uh, by upholding the will intent of the legislature to meet the purpose of the legislation. <clears throat> now, the term interpretation has come from the Latin term interpretari, which means to expound, explain, understand or translate. Now, according to Salmon, Interpretation or construction is a process by which courts seek to ascertain the meaning of the legislature through the medium of authoritative forms in which it is expressed. Now, the purpose of interpretation of statutes. Statutes need to be interpreted why? So as to clearly understand while applying the laws, what is the purpose of the legislation? What is the purpose of the law? For what purpose? or what was the intention behind making of that particular law? Now, Blackstone, he was a philosopher and he opined that the fairest and the rational method of interpreting a statute is by exploring you know, the intention of the legislature through the most natural and probable signs, which are either the words, the context, the subject matter, the effect, consequence or the spirit and the reason of the law. He says that you can actually find out or you can actually interpret the laws based on directly the words, the context, the subject matter of the law, 
the effect and the consequence or the spirit of the law or the reason of the law. Again, why do we need interpretation of statute is that the intention must correlate with the purpose or the aim of the statute. And also to understand the intricacies or the minute details that are involved in the statute. Now, interpretation is used to discover the true meaning of the law and language used in the law or statute. Interpretation of statute is a process that is used by the courts to understand the law by ascertaining the true intention of the legislate, uh, intention of the legislature or the legislative act. Now, it is a duty of the court to implement the laws judicious, judiciously and without any errors, thereby determining the true meaning of every law is a significant factor. Now, there are several rules of interpretation, okay? Now, this again, uh, I would like you to know that interpretation of statutes, again, is a complete different subject altogether a separate subject but you know just because we are studying under jurisprudence we are just going to just slightly touch upon these aspects like what is a statute uh, what is a uh, you know how the statutes are interpreted that is interpretation of statutes and also about constitutions of the world and international we're just slightly touching upon these aspects because we are studying it under the laws of under jurisprudence because jurisprudence is a study of legal theories so we just touching upon these aspects, but, you know, the interpretation of statute is an entirely different subject and it is a whole subject in itself. Are you understanding me? So if, if by chance, like you have the subject, it's a very interesting subject. Suppose you have it in the next semester. I'm not quite sure, but this is a very important subject where you learn how to, you know, get to know the meaning of the laws and uh, what are the different ways to really come, uh, you know, understand the meaning of various laws that are enacted, not only under your jurisdiction, but also across the globe. So just a slightly touched upon every aspect here. Like, what are the rules? There are several rules for interpretation of statutes. One is the literal rule. Literal rule means, as the name suggests, just as it is on the face of it, literally, literally. This is also called as grammatical rule of interpretation. This is to provide an ordinary or just a natural meaning to the words used in the law. Next is, what is the golden rule of interpretation? The next rule is, this rule of interpretation modifies the, see, I'll, I'll repeat it again. One was, the first one was literal or grammatical. See here, literal or grammatical rule of interpretation. Next is the golden rule of interpretation. This is yet another rule for interpreting statutes or uh, getting to know the meaning of the laws. <clears throat> this rule of interpretation modifies the literal rule of interpretation in case of absurdity when it is not clear in each statute. While using the golden rule of interpretation, it should be kept in mind that the court must modify the words to an extent of clearing the absurdity or requirements only. Now, the court cannot change the full statute. What it will do is, it will try to clear off the absurdity and look into the actual law as it is. That is a golden rule. They call it a golden rule. Next is the mischief rule. Now, the mischief rule of interpretation, as the name suggests, it tries to overlook the mischief or overlook the, uh, you know, something that is wrong in a particular statute. Let us go through the slide as it is. Mischief rule of interpretation is also known as the rule of beneficial construction or also called as Hayden's rule or purposive construction. This rule of mischief was developed in Hayden's case in 1584 and that is why this rule is called as a Hayden's rule. There are mainly four points that have to be considered while using the mischief rule of interpretation, which are as follows. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So the question that needs to be answered by the interpreter while using the mischief rule are, what was the prevalent law before the statute in question? So while they are interpreting the laws, 
they'll you know they'll try to ask these questions to themselves okay this law is available what was the earlier law before this second when if there was an earlier law then why did they come up with this new law and if they have come up with the new law that means there is a reason and the most probable reason is that the law was not strong enough or quite effective enough or it has not really catered to all the defects that the previous law did not cover next is what is the remedy now that is sought by the new law that is now passed by the parliament and what is the rationale or the reasoning behind the remedy so while using this form of interpretation which form of interpretation the mischief rule of interpretation these four questions have to be answered now these are the four points that should be taken into consideration while interpreting the statute using the principles of mischief rule the main purpose of the rule of mischief is to suppress the mischief and advance the remedy that means they want to overlook the mischief or the defect and they want to concentrate over the remedy that the statute is trying to provide next is the doctrine of harmonious construction one minute now according to the doctrine of harmonious construction the conflict between two or more statutes or two or more than two provisions of the same act must be interpreted in such a manner that should give effect to both the statutes and provisions of the same act now in simple words it is the duty of the court to interpret two or more inconsistent provisions of the same statute in a way so that both the provisions can persist or survive sometimes what happens that even in one particular law or a statute there will be like you know two sections or two articles which may not be you know uh, uh, which may not match each other they may be you know distinct from each other so what the courts will do is it will try to cut out every inconsistency and try to you know uh, uh, look at any particular provision in a harmonious way in the, in a way that it will try to cut off any conflict or inconsistencies in such a way that both the provisions which seem to be inconsistent with each other that they may survive or persist or both may remain in force next we'll move on to the constitutional laws or the constitution now something that you need to know under constitution is now every country has its own constitution and constitution in itself is a very vast subject as it is if you take the constitution for example of india uh, just before uh, you know suppose we get disconnected please join back as usual now like for example constitution of india is is the largest constitution like what does the constitution law provide it provides for the basic tenets the basic uh, you know the uh, rights that it gives to its people to the people of india the rights the duties the freedoms and uh, you know how states have to be governed how laws to be made uh, what are the different uh, parts of the government so the constitutional law basically is a fundamental law of any land most of the uh, nations in the world have got their own constitutions have got their own constitutional laws some are written some are unwritten however most of them are written so therefore you could say that constitution of any country or any jurisdiction is the basic or fundamental law of the land let's go through a slide merriam webster's dictionary defines constitution as the basic principles and laws of a nation state uh, in international law a country would be referred to as state okay or social group that determine the powers and duties of the government and guarantee certain rights to the people in it Now the free legal dictionary defines constitution as the fundamental law written or unwritten that establishes the character of a government by defining the basic principles to which a society must conform or that is follow by describing the organization of the government and regulation distribution and limitations on the functions of different governmental departments and by prescribing the extent and the manner of the exercise of its sovereign powers 
Now, therefore, you could call it as a legislative charter by which a government or a group derives its authority. It is a fundamental law of any land, like the constitution of any country is a fundamental of the land. And what I choose to call it, I choose to refer it to as Kelsen's Kelsen's theory in Kelsen, uh, Kelsen's theory, Kelsen came about with a grand norm. He says he calls it as a basic norm from which all other laws emanate. So thereby you could call constitution of any country as a fundamental law of the land and it operates as a grand norm, just as Kelsen said. And it is from this norm from which all other laws emanate. It is a supreme law of the land, the foundational law of the land. Now, why are we saying that it is a basic law or it, or it operates as a grand norm is if any other law is made which is against the constitution of any country, it would be struck down as bad. Why? Because the constitution of any country is a fundamental law of the land. Now, the constitution laws of the country may be written or unwritten uh, and characteristically function as an evolving body of legal custom and opinions. Now, any law that may be enacted which contravenes the basic edicts, as I said earlier, of the constitution of that country would be considered as a bad law and thereby would be struck down as bad or abrogated or, you know, repealed in entirety. Technically speaking, it would be considered as unconstitutional. Now, the constitution of India is the longest written constitution of any country in the world, while the constitution of Monaco is the shortest written constitution, just, just for your knowledge. The constitution of San Marino might be the world's oldest active written constitution since some of its core documents have been operation since 1600. While the constitution of the United States is the oldest active codified constitution, that is, it's divided into like, you know, articles and in, uh, you know, in um, uh, what they say, in a codified manner. So it is the oldest active codified constitution. <coughs> Sorry. Now we will move on to international law. What is international law? Now, international law is also called as the law of nations. International law is a body of law that comprises of treaties and conventional rules that govern the relationship between nations and countries. Now, the, the, I mean, the most, uh, you know, at the moment, the most current thing that could come to your mind with respect to you know, international law, of course, would be the Ukraine war, which is going on, the Russia and the Ukraine war. Okay, we'll talk about it later. However, international law, now what is it? It is a set of rules agreements, treaties that are binding between the state countries. Now, when sovereign states, we call it as a sovereign states, when they contract with each other, when nations contract with each other, such agreements are binding and enforceable. This is called international law. Now, what is international law? It's also called as law of nations. When one country contracts with another country or the two, three countries get together or, you know, group of countries get together and they uh, sign a particular agreement, and that would be called as a treaty. So that kind of a treaty or an agreement would be binding and it is enforceable. So that would form a part of international law. Now, Britannica def defines international law as, it calls it as a public international law or law of nations, the body of legal rules, norms, and standards that apply between sovereign states and other entities that are legally recognized as international actors. Now, this term was coined by English philosopher Jeremy Bentham. Now, Bentham's classic definition of international law is a collection of rules governing relations between states, thereby international law is distinct from domestic laws. What are domestic laws? Laws which are applicable within the territory of a country. Laws which are applicable within Somaliland is a domestic law. Laws which are applicable within UAE is a domestic law. Law which is applicable within India or within Russia, within Ukraine, within USA is a domestic law. Now, international law is a law which is a public domain where two or three nations are joined together. They have a basic understanding and that is drawn in the form of treaties to govern the relationship between the states or the nations. Now, this is called as international law. 
in international law the states those sovereign that is independent yet they obey international law for their mutual advantage uh, understand this point the countries are independent in themselves but still they are obligated to follow international law for what for mutual advantage now if the country you know uh, agrees with some other country to follow something or to abide by certain rules and they draw up a charter and they sign they are the signatories to it that means they are bound by that particular treaty for what for mutual advantage now r n gil christ opines that international law is a body of rules which civilized states observe in their dealings with each other these rules being enforced by each particular state according to its own moral standard or convenience with the improvement growth and development of international relations international law evolved and developed over the years in international law all nations are considered free and independent nations all nations are equal before the law be it russia poland india somalia china or any other country all have equal rights before the law if you get disconnected please join back now violation of international law or trespassing international law now what is the effect of that who is going to punish for violation of international law who is going to punish for infringement of international law now it depends what is the infringement about whether it is human rights infringement or a treaty infringement or covenant infringement or just understanding between the state parties infringement it depends now if a country or state violates international law the law itself does not cease to exist but the country state which violates is punished and is subject to trial by the icj icj that is international court of justice or the country may be expelled from the uno and its bodies example in the ongoing russia ukraine war russia is accused of severe war crimes and thereby was expelled out of the human rights council where only i think six countries of the world you know supported russia and every other country though they were friends with russia were not able to support russia because russia is at presently uh, at present accused of severe war crimes and it has not followed the the rules of the game in the sense you know uh, in the, i mean it's a slang way i'm telling you rules of the game in the sense it does not follow the edicts of international law it does not follow the you know the rules of international law the basic rule is that civilians or people should not be attacked in a war civilians or people are not to be attacked during a war so that was one of the basic uh, you know 